Um, this is a lightning talk that has run amok, basically. Uh, 17 databases in however many minutes we have, a bunch of animated GIF, probably Star Wars. There's actually no Star Wars, so I don't know why I say that. Um, and some Dungeons and Dragons for no real reason. But I am the walking embodiment of the stereotype that I've created in my own mind in sometime in 1992. So I've been <laughs> keeping the dream alive ever since. Uh, this is our cast that we're going to look at today. A um, bunch of different things. Some you have probably seen and heard of, some maybe not, some um, are quite complicated. This whole, this is, the, the general theme is this is, this whole talk is a bad idea um, and hopefully I won't hurt myself too much. I'm Toby, um, I work at Ninefold and let's get cracking. So distributed systems are really hard, depicted here is of course a distributed system. Um, databases are really fun. Um, lots of people, particularly in the Rails world, I think you get to gloss over the fact that at the heart of most of your systems and codes, there is a database of some description. Um, there is something that has the data. Um, and the inverse of this is also true. Everything is hard and also fun at the same time. Um, quick word from the people who aren't my sponsors, which is NoSQL or NewSQL. Various other SQLs, depending on what the flavor is. This whole thing just drives me absolutely nuts um, because SQL is the least of the problems that we're trying to solve um, in this world. So there are a few things that hopefully you have heard of. Um, the concept of ACID, which a database, a relational database that you work with, whether it's Postgres or MySQL, or the very, you know, the common things that we have. It has certain guarantees around how your data is going to be stored and how we interact with it. So it's atomic, it's consistent, it's isolated, it's durable. These are very handy and convenient guarantees. Along the lines of we store some data, we can get it back out. Lots of people can store some data. There's some sort of consistent view of what that data is. There's tons of maths behind this. People have been doing this now for a very, very long time. The other side of this, and this is sort of, I guess, where the more fashionable, trendy hipsters uh, like to come in, is talk about a thing called CAP, which is the CAP theorem or Brewer's conjecture. And this is about consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. ACID and CAP have essentially nothing to do with each other. I think that's why people get very confused um, when talking about the different properties that databases have. The consistency in CAP is not the same as the consistency in ACID. And that's very, it's kind of subtle, um, but I'm going to talk you through what all of that means. So Brewer's conjecture and the formal proof of this thing called the CAP theorem are almost but not quite entirely unalike. Um, this is the actual, this is where it all, all the problems actually started. A guy called Brewer said he had this slide in a keynote he gave um, in 2000, and he was theorizing that when it comes to distributed systems, you can only have two of these three different properties, consistency, availability, and tolerance to network partitions. Um, there's like four other slides on this topic in that whole keynote, and that was all he really said. So what happened in, in the way of good scientists? Some people took that idea, saw that there was a grain of truth in it, and actually decided to create some formal proofs um, and try and see if this was true. So the actual theorem is that it is impossible in an asynchronous network model to implement a read-write data object that guarantees that you have the data that is both available and atomically consistent at the same time. And this is where all of the trouble in distributed systems really start and end, and I hate that slide. Um, so, back to distributed systems. Everything is distributed. The, the web as a model is inherently distributed and that, that seems self-evident. You have a browser and a server, you're instantly building distributed systems. Your Rails app is actually also distributed. In most cases, you have a Rails bit, the code, running on an app server, talking to a database. 
They're t they can be two different things, therefore they're distributed by definition. They're on, if they are communicating across the network, even if it's local, you are now building a distributed system. Most of the time we ignore that fact and we get away with it with varying degrees of success. So this is completely unreadable, but it doesn't matter because it's rubbish. Um, it was basically someone trying to take all of these different databases in, the, in sort of the modern era. Uh, if you spend a weekend at a hackathon, you too could be a NoSQL startup. I highly recommend it as a career opportunity. Um, and they're trying to basically put different databases into different um, categories. And the general way we think about this is that you have this notion of consistency, that the data is always the same for everyone. You have the idea of availability, where the client can access that data. And you have the idea of partition tolerance, which is networks can go down, systems can stop communicating, and the, the overall system will still function. And the way this kind of gets misinterpreted is you can pick two of these properties. And it's actually not quite, again, the case. What we're actually saying is that when there's a partition, when two systems cannot communicate, you get to choose between being consistent or being available. That's actually what we're saying. Um, so I will demonstrate this with a picture. We're going to have here a cluster of nodes communicating between each other. Um, I've actually worked in a company that, that looked a lot like this in stand-ups. Um, <laughs> no, we don't do stand-ups, it's fine. Okay, we've got two nodes. Now these are, these, they're, they're different nodes, so again, they're inherently distributed. And now we've got data coming into one node, that's all cool. We have data then being transferred to the other node. These are now synchronizing or replicating in some way. We've got reads coming off the other node. This is all kind of cool. And now we're going to sever the communication between them. So this now is what happens. The writes are coming into one node. It now knows the truth of the bank account balance or the, you know, the client's phone number or whatever it is. And by the virtue of science, the other node cannot possibly have a consistent state anymore. It cannot accept if they cannot communicate, they cannot be consistent. And that's essentially what all of this gibberish and all of these arguments are actually trying to show you is that if two nodes can't talk to each other, they can't talk to each other. That's <laughs> and so data goes in one and the other one doesn't know about it. So all of the blog posts and all of the cap theorem is not true and all of these other things, they're actually trying to draw this diagram of two, two different boxes trying to talk to each other and work out what's going on. Of course then the network partition has come back up and we're back into a state. The other node can catch up or do whatever it needs to do and, and all sorts of things happen. All right, it gets more complicated. <laughs> and then you've got lots of nodes and let's not worry about that. So in light of now having at least a little bit of sort of the science underneath what is hard about distributed systems, how do two systems that may or may not be actually communicating together at any given point of time, I'd like to introduce you to our adventurer party that we're gonna be talking about today. And also as an aside, like what is the deal with outbursts? Someone pointed out to me that this, no, no outbursts, aficionados? <laughs> the owlbear is, owlbear is the French version. Uh, the owlbear, <laughs> It's a Dungeons and Dragons monster that is the hybrid of an owl and a bear. But interestingly, it's like the least scary properties of either. So like if the bear flew and had big bear teeth, that would probably be more scary than a lumbering, pecking, anyway, doesn't matter. <laughs> I only realized that like on Monday, which is why it's in here. So, um, so Postgres, you are, Postgres. We're going to start with something nice and simple. It's MySQL for hipsters. It's totally awesome. So the really exciting thing about Postgres these days is you can get rid of Mongo because Postgres does JSON. <laughs> and that is a good thing. Um, 
Postgres is one of those technologies that seems to, like it just gives people a, a warm glow of satisfaction that it's done right. It's like solid engineering. It's a database, you've all used it. It's consistent, it's relational. Um, databases in the, this world, because of their ACID guarantees, they take consistency as the world view that they will have. They will keep the data consistent at the cost of availability, which is why mostly we have single points of failure in our Rails apps. And the, ma the master database is down, and essentially you're down until the slave can come back up. That's essentially the model in this world view. Uh, HStore is cool. HStore is basically a key value store embedded to Postgres, definitely worth looking at. Um, there's actually pretty much now with 9.2 and 9.3 full JSON query ability. Um, and really, I would say that Postgres and databases like this, they're not actually distributed. They're not truly a distributed system. You can build various things that get you to a shadow of distribution with failover and replication, but it's not quite the same thing. Um, yeah, HStore lets you embed uh, key value things into a, a single column. The really cool part about this stuff is you can index this just as if it's a normal value. So you can actually have nested structures in your HStore that you index on and join across tables and do all of this awesome, crazy stuff. Uh, there's already an active record building with that. JSON, as I mentioned, that's like, there's some really interesting things that they're trying to solve and they're actually merging the JSON and HStore sort of engines inside to be, be the same world view. You can um, store JSON objects, you can index the queries off them, uh, the new stuff that's coming up, you can actually query into the JSON structures and do like lots of the things that MongoDB is kind of famous for. But I've got a whole lot of other section mocking MongoDB, so we'll get to that. Uh, MySQL, it's the same difference, right? Um, but when you really want a database <laughs> that is owned by an evil overlord, then MySQL is increasingly the choice. It's not animated, I'm sorry. So. It's essentially the same deal. Um, my school's advantage, I guess, is that it's everywhere. Um, I blame PHP for that. It's like a virus where self-replicating virus where every server you get has, a, has like an infection of PHP and MySQL, which is fine. Um, easily eradicated, topical <laughs> treatment. Um, it's, it actually works really well with PHP. Um, who knew? But on some of the benchmarks, the actual PHP MySQL thing is like crazy faster than like native and Java and all sorts of things when PHP itself isn't that good, but this, this area itself is so highly optimized. Um, they, uh, because of their evil overlords, they're fully buzzword compliant. Um, they've got a thing called the NoSQL API, which is like this ridiculous, they just, someone mashed at a keyboard until the memcached API was embedded into MySQL, and they were like, yeah, fucking sell that. <laughs> um, so that was cool. Most people are actually doing different things now. So MariaDB, there's some Linux distros because their fight for freedom come with MariaDB. Pocona servers actually, if you're really serious about high performance MySQL, um, they've got like a totally tuned, optimized, custom kind of thing that's still all open source and you know the, the opposite of the Oracle world. And there's this crazy thing called TokuDB, which is essentially a research project of fractal indexes mashed into MySQL and for some sorts of workloads it's just like off the hook kind of performance for um, particularly geospatial information. So there's some really interesting things that are still happening that you know, the, the Oracle world kind of clouds and makes a bit a bit difficult. So we're into our first uh, postmodern database. So Dynamo is interesting. It was a paper published by Amazon that kind of came up with this model for managing distributed systems. And actually, the next couple of databases we'll look at are all kind of around this model. Uh, DynamoDBs really had some great innovations in pricing. Um, if you go to the Amazon calculator, it you like pay per query or something, I don't know. It's, 
it's like a maths there you can hire a mathematics PhD to tell you what your bill will be and that's excellent um, but the thing that so there's like a couple of different flavors of it in the MySQL in the Amazon world um, that it's basically a giant key value store it has guarantees around the latency um, you know they've got very it's highly tunable to workloads all of this kind of stuff um, because it's key value you are now that you are jumping through hoops to get complicated queries done so a key value store is lit like a giant hash in the sky um, so you have a key and you have a value and you know your manager says you know what was our monthly revenue and you're like don't know um, <laughs> Because you have to iterate through the whole thing, whereas with a SQL database, it's doing that for you. It's still iterating through some stuff, but it's all magic. But the really interesting thing that it did was kind of show people a model for distribution that has now been popularized. And if you're interested in this stuff, um, it's definitely worth looking at Dynamo. React is essentially an implementation of that Dynamo paper. So the React is really awesome is all I have to say about it. Um, I know quite a few people who sort of sit down and you're all kind of on Monday having a beer during the same owlbear conversation, actually. Um, and I was like, wouldn't it be awesome to have a problem that you could solve with React? I was like, yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> so again, it's a key value store. It is what we call um, tunable consistency. So it does clustering in a really awesome way. You add a node and it joins a cluster. It's really cool. There's no master slave. There's no, none of that um, sort of extra setup. It is from the world view that our systems are inherently distributed. You can add, um, add more nodes. They all just work out. Um, has a REST API, again, with a key value kind of thing is its main world view. Lots of people use it to just store a JSON document. And, um, but in general, the query kind of structure that you have on top is get me that document by the ID that it's attached to. Um, people who do operations love this stuff. Because rather than having a massive cluster of databases chained together, like having a cluster, that, having a system that is inherently clustered gives you some really interesting benefits. Um, the, the other thing it does is cloud storage, which is kind of cool. It can um, work like Amazon S3, and you can store blobs of content in it if you yeah, just use Amazon S3, really. But um, that's fine. Uh, and also, they get, a, they get an extra uh, bonus point for convergent replicated data types, which no one knows. No. Um, basically, there's a whole, like, the, the stuff that's interesting about this is when academic research bleeds into the commercial world in a really positive way. So convergent replicated data types are data types that are designed to be distributed. So you have, they've got counters and arrays and hashes, and they're designed to be distributed across nodes and eventually they will be consistent. And it's like crazy tech is coming in React 2. Um, what basically happens is the data gets hashed. As data comes in, it gets hashed, and the nodes coordinate amongst themselves to distribute that data in a way that is redundant. And this is essentially, this is the Dynamo paper here. They, they came up with this hacking, hashing algorithm, um, which basically takes data and works out where on a giant ring of hashes that will be. And then each node can take a different bit, and then the data is replicated across multiple nodes and you know, the more nodes you add, the more performance you get, the more redundancy you can add, you can tune some of the parameters. Um, internally, it uses a thing called a vector clock, which is basically a way to track versions of the same data across time. But the, the shorthand for that is it's your problem. So <laughs> um, what they're actually doing is, you know, in a, in a in a relational database, you write some data and it's kind of saved. Um, with this, it will actually track the version of the data. And so now you've got, you know, say two blog entries because one of them came later and the, the cluster can't work out what you meant. 
And it's not the cluster's job, it just has the data. It's actually the application's job to work out what condition led you to that point. So, you know, you go, oh, well, that author came later, and that's fine, that's easy. Or now we actually have a merge operation, and it, it's a bit more like Git in its structure than it is like um, you're just saving a file. Like there are certain points where the data store doesn't profess to have an opinion about how to, to handle this data, which is actually what you want in lots of cases. Because in lots of cases, you just lost two conflicting commits because the last one just went across the top. Um, in some cases, that's a point where you actually need to work out what to do with that. So React's kind of worldview is, yeah, there it is. Meh. Go, whatever. Uh, it has the beauty, beautiful thing of a very simple API. You've got buckets that have a name. They have keys with a value. You get back a document. It's cool. Uh, there's library built into. Uh, there's a gem you can use called Ripple, which lets you store JSON documents and do some extra things. Uh, React has secondary indexes and things you can query in. And there's heaps of, if you're at all interested in distributed stuff, there's a ton of really awesome things on the Basho React document um, repository. So Bigtable is Google's kind of answer to that. Um, I'm not going to talk about it too much, but they win because they've got a sparse distributed multi-dimensional sorted map. And as you'll see, um, most of this is Google just telling everyone to go fuck themselves. Um, hundreds of petabytes of data, 30 million operations a second. Like, no one has this problem. Uh, <laughs> and then they've done two things after that which are just even more aggressively antagonistic to the rest of the world. They made a thing called Spanner and then a thing called F1. And they've kind of proved that you can do like a relational, fully distributed, atomic thing, but all you need is GPS in every server that you've got and atomic clocks in every data center. And, you know, again, just go, go fuck yourselves. Um, but they solve the problem, right? Good on you. So the rest of us struggle with other things. So Cassandra is another one. Um, I would say it's less... It has that less inspirational sort of engineering that React seems to, to give people a glow about, but um, increasingly, oh yeah, eventually persistent. Ah, oh, it's too dark. Yay, he wins. Um, so again, Cassandra has come from the distributed dynamo kind of worldview. Um, I, I looked at this ages and ages ago, and it was just, it was so awful. You, if you, you described your structures in XML files, like your, your kind of tables, and then you had to start and stop the server every time you did something. It's like, wow, this is so Java. It's like, great. Um, but since, and then the protocol was a thrift. So all they had was a lo lightweight binary protocol. And then it turns out that JavaScript can't count, and there's a whole lot of other problems going on. Um, so anyway, they, they really nailed some of this stuff. They have a whole query language built on top of it now that is almost but not quite SQL. So you're actually looking at a giant cluster of data, um, but it kind of looks and feels like a normal database. Um, the way they break it up, actually, though, is it's a set of columns um, which are really Slightly hard to explain. Um, but, <laughs> and in the olden days, they used to make you kind of think about this stuff in great detail. So with a column database, you, you're no longer thinking in terms of um, rows and tables. A column is essentially um, an, a key value namespace, but then you can slice and dice that in different ways, and it gets really quite complicated, and we're going to run out of time if I dwell on it. Um, but you end up with something that's like select star from playlists, which is kind of cool. Netflix are using um, Cassandra now for pretty much everything they do because their whole worldview is distributed all the time. Um, and I think a thousand nodes ish is like the biggest Cassandra cluster. And this reminded myself to speed up. The coffee machine broke. That is awful. <laughs> Ah, great. <laughs> so yeah, Cassandra is crazy and definitely worth looking at if you kind of have these problems. Now I know Memcache isn't a cache. 
isn't a database, it's a cache. Um, but I thought I'd mention it here because caching is actually the, the point in your Rails application where you have now made its distributed properties really overt and your life is now miserable. So um, lots of people can, you know, there, there are things built into Rails where you can just slip memcached in and you don't really have to think about it, but now you have to invalidate the data and you've got state between your database and your Rails application being held by some other thing. Um, and that is, in essence, the core of the distributed systems problem. So my, memcache is awesome because it's so trivially simple. It's just a handful of methods. And again, it's just, it's just a giant hash in the sky, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can just easily, one of the things that's really appealing about it is you can, in the Rails world, just map um, things to memcache. It's built in for sessions and um, fragments and all of these other kind of things. Ah, Redis I do want to talk about. So Redis is f funny because it's kind of taken over in the Rails <laughs> world um, and we use it for queuing. Like not that many people use it as a database but with Sidekick and Rescue and these kind of libraries we use it as a queue. It's not a queue but it's, it can function as one. Um, again, it's key value. It's really interesting properties are you've got a whole set of um, data structures that you can treat in memory. It's beyond that simple, here's a key and here's a blob of data. You've got arrays and sets and you've, you've even got hashes and you can do all this crazy stuff. It's super fast because it's super dumb. Um, basically, it's a single threaded just everything's in memory. It does some really smart things. It's really cunningly engineered. Um, it, it is not distributed. And in fact, I would say if you, if you are using it in any distributed sense, you're, gonna, you're terrified if you actually look, you should be terrified if you look under the covers because um, it's got a very naive approach to replication and they, they try and, you know, it's basically you put your data in and then at some point it streams into the next node and like it has no opinion about really, you know, it's like, hey, it's all great. Um, and it will be great until it's not. Um, and you won't know that because things are broken. Uh, it does have some interesting properties. You can do something that looks a little bit like transactions. Um, you can check and set values. So you can, you can kind of do these um, multiple steps. Lots of people use it in uh, Rails. You can basically just map um, workers, and we don't have time for any gratuitous sides. Uh, Neo4j is a graph database. So that I, I've never, it's a really interesting one. The tech is crazy cool. Um, it basically looks at your data as a series of nodes connected, and some of their like hello world kind of stuff is like crazy cool. Like they solve traveling salesmen problem for small values of traveling salesmen, like which, which no, you know, which cities are these things in? And they're like, yeah, it's just a query. And um, so like they, they do amazing stuff, um, but then it has a lot of very similar problems that you're going to find in, in other like single point of failure databases that you have your data here and it streams out and they just made that a little bit harder because it's so to the edge of the, the mainstream. Uh, that's enough, that's the only joke I'm gonna make about Couch, uh, MongoDB. Um, Mongo is actually, I think Cam's point this, this morning was really interesting that if that's a trade-off you're making, um, it's gonna be fine. Lots of people actually believe the web scaleness of <laughs> MongoDB and I think, the way I feel about it is it's like MySQL in the early days. When that came out, if you knew anything about databases, you were just like, transactions are like a thing. You know, you've, you've got like SQL over flat files. That's not a database, dudes. Um, and everyone's like, slash dot. Remember slash dot were like the ones who had invested in it because they didn't understand databases either. So anyway. Um, <laughs> What happened to them? See, it's a lesson for you hipster kids. Uh, so anyway, the thing that's really good about it is it's, it is beautiful to interact with when you are trying to move really fast. Um, it's less beautiful to interact with 
when you care about your data and you're trying to get it to work. But they've got tons of money now and they'll probably like go back and rewrite it. I would, I would suggest in some ways they will rewrite most of it with like correctness in mind in the same way that MySQL, like no one uses MySAM anymore, like they just slipped a whole new storage engine which turns out to you know, be a database. Um, that's important. So this stuff is really, really hard. And the, the critiques that are most interesting to me about MongoDB are the ones from the academic world with people who actually really understand distributed systems just kind of going, a priori, MongoDB doesn't really work. And yeah, so that's kind of interesting. There's a couple of other ones coming around now. Uh, RethinkDB, like it wouldn't surprise me if Mongo ended up buying them or something because they're like starting from the opposite end of like, let's do everything correctly. So nothing works, um, <laughs> or it, it works very slowly, but it's correct, um, which is kind of the interesting way of doing it because that was Postgres's model. Everyone hated Postgres because you, you, know, you would query and go off and have a coffee and come back and, hey, it's, my data's there. This is, this is just, this shows that I really need some other hobbies because I was about to call this sexy. Um, but yeah, these guys, um, it's an academic project and it has like some crazy science behind it. They, they're basically making a consistent key value store that is inherently distributed. So it's kind of like Redis if you built it from the ground up to be distributed. And some of the stuff they're doing is, is a bit like the, the sense you get with Amazon and some of those others. Is they're just showing off. They're like, yeah, we, we do transactions. It's cool, right? Like, do you find that hard? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so it's really cool, but it's like really bleeding edge and um, not necessarily going to work in production. This is just a GIF. Um, that's pretty much Hadoop right there. You don't have this problem. Uh, if you can work out how to actually install the fucker, good, well done to you. Um, I have a friend who, he's a bit of an asshole, but he, he he calls, it, he calls it small to medium data because he had an actual data problem where their data set was like growing at terabytes a day. And so he's like, oh yeah, your, your small to media, medium data problem, like, yeah, you need Hadoop for that, do you? It's like, just buy more RAM. Um, and he, he told me that actually all the really cool kids who have actual data problems are looking at things like this. So I assume he knows what he's talking about, so that's cool. Uh, Un something, unpolite. This one's interesting, and they've just the same guys have launched another one called Vetus. It's basically a NoSQL SQL Lite kind of thing. So it it kind of looks like MongoDB, but it's just embedded, like it's embeddable. And Vetus is Redis, but um, in process. So you can kind of embed a whole Redis into your application. So there's some things that that could be cool for, but we're Ruby, so we don't do any of those. Um, and the last one is Elasticsearch, which I have this conversation fairly frequently with people about Elasticsearch, which is, why don't we just make that the data store? It is so cool. Um, so Elasticsearch, it's, it's officially a search engine. You index documents and um, they're JSON and you can do stuff with it. Um, it's clustered from the ground up, like it has a strong idea of what being distributed means. You spin up a new node, it can actually add itself into the cluster. Um, the stuff it's being used for now, they've kind of merged with Logstash and Kibana who do log processing. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's such a beautiful, beautiful system. Um, you can do crazy complicated queries, you can build all sorts of stuff and it's great. So that was me. I think. I have zero time left. I think I nailed it. <laughs> Almost. I love that gift. So, I was Toby. <laughs> Thank you.